Over the last two episodes, we've been working on lifting our 78 Firebird, and we pretty much finished up the front suspension and its lift spindles. So it's about time we get back to the half-finished rear suspension, including those temporary shackles that have been on the car for over a year. We're gonna build our own shackles to replace them, but before we can start, there are a few things to figure out. You can see that the bushings on here stick pretty far out from the springs. I'm more used to seeing three inch wide bushings, but these are all the way out there at three and three quarters. And we could certainly make our shackles fit those, but that extra width has always been pretty tough for exhaust clearance. If we lift the back of the car up and set the body down on jack stands so that the axle is hanging, the driver's side outer shackle is pinning the exhaust tip against the quarter panel. And that's after we modified those for additional clearance years ago. So it would be nice to narrow up those bushings and to figure out if that's at all possible, we'll disassemble one side of the rear suspension and pull the bushings out of the leaf spring as well as the body of the car, just to make sure that they are all the same. Which fortunately is the case, but is just about the only simple part of this situation. These were installed in early 2016 and came from a complete suspension kit for the car. We've already established that I don't care for the width of them, but that's not the only dilemma. These bushings don't employ a steel inner sleeve, and instead the shackle half tightens down against this shoulder on the special factory bolts, and because of this design, they only have a 7 16 thread diameter. I'd really like to step up to 9 16 of an inch through bolts, so I went looking for an entirely different set of bushings. They're set up to use steel sleeves that are included in the kit, and that's a 3 inch wide standard style. These are exactly what I was looking for, except one little thing. These are made for an inch and a half inner diameter spring eye, and as it turns out, the Firebird uses a 1.6. So these definitely aren't gonna work, but I was able to find a Camaro kit that unfortunately was out of stock, but I cross-referenced the bushing to another manufacturer and found this set, which, as it turns out, are 1.7 inches in diameter. This is getting a little ridiculous. That about exhausts the reasonably priced options, so instead, let's make something fit. We could modify the old bushings, but I'd kinda like to keep them around, and it seems like it would be less effort to modify this set. With these, all we have to do is turn down the outer diameter, and I think I have an idea of how to do that. I did once watch Sean sit there and get covered in blue polyurethane to make bushings fit, but I think we now have a more civilized option. Oh yeah, I bet we can turn these guys down on the mini lathe. In order to make this work, we're gonna need a way to chuck that in there. I did dig up leftover pieces of three quarter inch aluminum that we made those idler standoffs out of. There's a lot of friction, it sure doesn't easily spin on there. We've just got a regular old carbide tip cutter on here. And what the heck, let's just go for it. This material does machine strangely, but it is definitely working. After that trimming, we're looking at just over 1.6 inches. And once we've smoothed over the corner with a coarse file, it's looking pretty good. Here's our turned down bushing, and if we hold it up against the other one, check that out. And yes, it is a perfect fit in the spring eye. And here's an unmodified one for comparison. You can see it's not a big difference. I mean, it's a hundred thousandths of an inch. We only have to do that seven more times without me managing to screw it up. Yeah, the odds are not amazing. I'm gonna mark here on the dial, should be right where we need it. And once we work out the process a bit, it's pretty impressive how easy it is to machine this particular compound. It's definitely weird, but kind of satisfying in an eraser and a pencil sharpener kind of way. And even though we have eight of these to do, we're getting through them in a hurry. Again, it's not all that much material that we're removing, but that fluffy red dust sure is coming off of there and making a pretty big mess. But at least it's a lot more concentrated and less airborne than using the belt sander. Using that file on them worked great, and the surface finish isn't actually that bad. It's not shiny anymore, and I mean, you can feel that it's rough, but I don't think it'll have any problems installing or anything. I'm pretty happy with how these bushings came out, but it is unfortunate we couldn't have just bought them in the first place. 
I tried to, actually. I had paid for that Camaro set before I found out it was backordered. After a few weeks with no shipping updates, I requested to cancel it, and what do you know? A day after machining those bushings, guess what shows up? Ain't that just the way? I didn't respond when I asked him to cancel it. Uh, yeah, hey, those are uh, 1.6 inches. Look at that. <laughs> these are the freaking bushings I was trying to get the whole time. Well, I'm going to return these now. Oh, well, at least I had the life experience of lathe turning bushings, and on top of the fact that we saved about 15 bucks for turning that energy suspension kit, there's still a prize at the bottom of the box. The bushing set that included the ones we modified came with four additional bushings. They're a little bit smaller and meant to fit the shackle to frame mounts on a truck, but I think we can make use of them. Back at the front of the car, the ends of the center link use special seals. I had trouble keeping these intact, and a few years back found this Mopar foam washer that is working great on the idler arm, but the pitman arm connection is a little bit taller and that foam washer won't work. All that's on there right now are some custom cut rubber washers that are in the process of falling apart, and while they're better than nothing, they're certainly not ideal. So what if we made one out of a tougher material, like for instance, polyurethane. As it turns out, the dimensions of these spare bushings are pretty close, so all we need to do is cut out a couple of washer-shaped chunks. The lathe made it easy to get started, and then we'll cut the rest of the way through by hand. We'll cut out two different options, one that's about the same height as those foam washers, and one that's a bit taller. To give those a try, we'll break the center link free from the pitman arm, and once those are separated, drop on our tall red washer. This one is about 3 eighths of an inch tall and seems to be the perfect height. It squishes just a bit when tightened down, but not too much. We'll torque that back to 40 foot-pounds. And once it's been pinned in place, we'll turn the steering back and forth to make sure the seal doesn't want to go anywhere. At least for now, that's looking pretty great and at the very least is better than the old seal situation. So we may as well take this opportunity to grease all of the joints on the front end. That includes the upper ball joints, lower ball joints, outer tie rod ends, inner tie rod ends, idler arm, and pitman arm fittings. It's great to have that out of the way, but we're actually supposed to be working on the rear suspension, so let's jump back in and start building our custom shackles. We'll start off with this piece of quarter inch thick mild steel plate, which will be getting the angle grinder treatment to cut out four pieces that are 11 and a quarter by two and a quarter inches. With those down to size and deburred, we'll stack them up on the drill press and get started with a quarter inch bit. From there, we'll size both ends of the links up to half of an inch before separating them so that we can use a step bit to bring them to 9 sixteenths. Or I guess a little underneath that because it took some filing before a 9 16 of an inch bolt actually fit. These links are starting to look pretty good, but we're definitely not going to leave those sharp corners on there, so we'll do some cutting and sanding to round them over. Now pretty much all we need is a brace to connect the pairs of links and make them nice and sturdy. We'll make sure to leave plenty of space on the leaf spring and body sides of the shackle, and from those measurements, it seems like two 5 inch by 3 and a quarter inch plates will be just the right size. And with those trimmed down, we'll give all of our plates a once over with the flap disc so that they're ready to be welded once we have them assembled. I don't actually have the correct hardware yet, so we're just going to use the factory carriage bolts and a bunch of washers to keep them aligned, with the inside width being set by the 3 inch sleeves we'll be using and some cardboard washers. Though in hindsight I should have just used standard 16th inch ones to make the shackles easier to install. Once the bolts are tight and those links are sitting flat against the table, we'll get that clamped in the vise, position a bracing plate, and start welding. We'll stick these together on the inside and outside edges, then once they've cooled down, use a flap disc to hide the crimes and make them look nice. As usual though, I seem to have underestimated the ability of welding to move metal around. Those sleeves that were a nice fit are now a little bit snug. I'd like to have a little bit more leeway, especially since I'm going to paint these. But we shouldn't have any problems using a pair of bolts to get ourselves a little bit more room. 
With the hardware in position, all we have to do is hold the bolt head still and turn the nuts counterclockwise to force the sides of the shackle apart with a fair bit of force. We'll open those up until they're about three and a quarter inches apart, and then turn the nuts clockwise to let them spring back. They do move a fair bit, but we can see that a sleeve now fits nicely. We'll do this on both sides of both shackles, and that little bit of extra play shouldn't be a problem since when the bolts are torqued down on the car, there will definitely be enough force to pull the sides of the shackle back in. With those fitting how I want them to, we'll consider them done and ready for paint. We finish those up just in time for the bolts to arrive. The packaging leaves something to be desired. But this was the best price I could find on a set of these 916 bolts and ended up being cheaper than buying them individually. It's looking like we finally have everything we need to put these on the car, so let's go ahead and do it. Starting on the driver's side where the test fitting shackles are still installed. With the axles supported, we'll go ahead and remove the bolts, links, and bushings. With the last of the old ones off of the car, we'll grease up our new set of parts and start pressing them into place. Once a pair of bushing halves has been installed, next up is the sleeve. With that fully pressed into the leaf spring, we can do the same for the upper mount, which is a little bit more awkward to get to, but the process is the same. And, as is the case for a lot of things, a pry bar and a large pair of channel locks makes this much easier. Then, of course, the passenger side is going to need bushings as well. Now that those are all in place, we can push the upper end of one of our shackles up into position and lock it in place with a through bolt. We'll leave that loose for now and get the lower end aligned with the leaf spring with its very own bolt tapped into place. That's one side taken care of, let's see if the other one goes as smoothly. The upper end fits a little bit snug, but we eventually managed to get it aligned and bolted in place. Then, with some maneuvering of the leaf spring, we've got everything locked in. We'll get the shackle hardware snugged down and let the axle off of the jack stands. It's no surprise that the shackles are still pointing a bit forward, which is not great for ride quality, but we'll just have to see how everything looks on the ground when fully assembled. Otherwise, everything is looking pretty good, and we certainly do have a lot more exhaust clearance with those narrower bushings. What we, however, don't have at full droop is any room for the parking brake cable. It's hard up against the drive shaft, and the uh, brakes are actually a little bit applied right now. But even at ride height, it's still just barely touching. I'm just gonna unhook it for right now and leave it out of the way. Which just involves backing the adjuster nut all the way off so that we can remove the cable link and equalizer. That'll just hang out for now until we sort out everything else that might be in its way, such as the exhaust. When the small block engine came out of the car, we removed everything in front of the mufflers, and I was hoping to reuse the intermediate pipes, although we will have to make them a bit shorter since the big block headers are a bit longer. I think we'll be able to get away with just trimming the side that goes into the muffler, and after a quick test fit, we'll cut about an inch off and see how that looks. With that slid all the way into the muffler, it's clear that the pipe is still a little on the long side. I don't think we could actually get a collector gasket in there, but it's close enough to call this a successful test fit and move over to the driver's side. Which, after some trimming, checking, and more trimming, seems to fit nicely. That looks pretty good. And after seeing those in place, it occurred to me that, well, what if we just ran the parking brake cable underneath the exhaust? It's not rubbing on the drive shaft, which is a bigger concern, and these are just uncoated stainless steel cables, so they shouldn't have a problem with the heat. I am a little worried that this clamp is going to bounce around and make a lot of really annoying noise, but for the time being it's good enough, and I really just have to move on. As for the exhaust to body mounts, I have a different plan. This exhaust kit came with polyurethane insulators and these big sheet metal screws, which over time tended to come loose, and one eventually fell out. So I've been thinking about how to implement a better mounting solution, and I've got an idea. 
If I drill this hole out just a tiny bit larger, I can get a three eighths inch bolt up in there and just put a nut on that. So I'm basically installing a stud. That'll be way stronger than the sheet metal screws and we can get a lock nut on there so it will not fall off and we don't have to tighten it so much it crushes that insulator. We'll use a step bit to size up our access port until we can just barely get the head of a three eighths of an inch bolt in there and bring the hole from the sheet metal screw up to 25 60 fourths. Then we need to get the bolt up inside of that channel and with some careful maneuvering and the help of a strong magnet, we can get the bolt pulled into place. Aha. To hold it there, we'll install a nut and use a pair tighten against each other to hold the bolt still as we get that nice and snug. We will have to reconfigure the exhaust mounting bracket a bit since the position is lower than before, but it seems like this stud should work. So we'll do it all over again on the driver's side. The main difference here is that we drilled our own access port instead of working with one already in the channel. The rest of the process went smoothly and pretty soon we've got a second stud ready to go. Now we just need to finalize the position of the exhaust. The driver's side pipe needs to be shortened just a little bit more and the passenger side pipe is going to get an O2 sensor bung installed. The reason for that O2 sensor bung is this, a wide band air fuel ratio gauge that should make tuning this much easier. There's not a great place in the header collector to fit it. It only could possibly really go right up here and it's not necessarily far enough from where the pipes come together to do a whole lot of good. So we will be relying on this flange to seal completely so that we don't get messed up readings. And it looks like that's a good spot. I marked it with a Sharpie already. Armed with a plan, we'll remove the intermediate pipes, and from the lines we drew, we can see that this pipe was in there about an inch and a quarter, and this one a little more than an inch and a half. Probably going to cut these down to something like three quarters of an inch. If it's too long, it's going to cause all kinds of issues. With the pipes cut to length, we'll drill a hole for the O2 sensor, and size it up until we have just the right fit. We'll prep the surrounding area with a flap disc, get the bung in place, and weld it all the way around. That's the O2 sensor bung all welded up and ready to reinstall, but while everything is apart and set up to weld, I think I'm gonna put this in the driver's side tube just to have it there. I don't have any plans to run dual O2 sensors, but for diagnostic and tuning purposes, it could be useful one day to be able to switch the O2 sensor from one side to the other. For now, the driver's side one is just going to get a plug. This will get anti-seized in. It doesn't have a seal on it really, but I think just tightening it down will be plenty. But uh, we'll do that under the car because I want to make sure after they're bolted up that the sensor actually fits in both before tightening everything down. I have my old nasty exhaust clamps. So I tried to clean them up a little bit. We'll also be reusing the collector gaskets. These are just solid aluminum ones and I'll clean them up a little bit with some like 220 grit sandpaper. Oh, and I have a new pair of these snap grommets, that's what they call them, since we were missing one of the old ones that fell out, and the one that was left is kind of smashed and gross. And with all that prep work done, the exhaust is ready to reinstall, hopefully for good this time. With the collector loosely connected, we'll make sure the exhaust is seated in the muffler and tighten those three bolts down. And yes, those are nylon lock nuts on there. This is a bit of an experiment. To my surprise, for the last 1500 miles of the Pinto road trip, it had nylon lock nuts on the collector and they didn't melt. So I wanted to see if this would be any different. To help ensure a good seal at the other end of the pipe, we'll slather that connection with copper RTV and install the band clamp. And while it feels snug, that didn't go without incident. These are the bolts that came with the clamps. These are 7 16 grade eight, and they uh, pulled two threads off, not out of this bar here, so that must be hardened, but off of the bolts themselves. So I just put three washers on so that they're grabbing on different threads and they tighten down just fine, which should be enough to keep everything in place. Next, we'll mate the driver's side pipe to the muffler and collector, tighten down the front, making sure everything is aligned, and finish up by torquing the muffler clamp. You can see they're not real even. This one sits kind of close to the drive shaft. I think it's at a little bit of an angle here, but that's down to these sections. I just don't care that much. The parking brake cable, probably just put a heat wrap on the exhaust right there. And when we set this up for good, I'll put a lock nut back on there. We do have a good amount of adjustment. Let's get the O2 sensor and the plug installed. 
The driver side plug will get a thorough coating of anti-seize and we'll tighten that down by feel. And over on the passenger side, do the same thing for the sensor. Of course, it's not hooked up to anything just yet, but at least this is sorted for now. And we'll go ahead and take care of the mid-car exhaust mounts. With the help of a thin stainless washer, new isolators, and redesigned bracketry, we'll get the U-bolt back in place on the pipe and tighten everything down. The bracket on this side needed a bigger change and an extension, so I kind of just folded over one of those trans cooler mount straps because I didn't really feel like doing anything else. The passenger side was much more straightforward and only required a bit of bending before it all went together. That about finishes up the exhaust, and next time we should be finishing the suspension.